Thanks for doing that. So I'm going to talk to you about um, collapse and the closure of the physical today. Can the online people hear me all right? Yeah. And um, so I'll, in fact, do that in order. So the first, talk of the, the first part of the talk will be concerned with physics only. And the second part of the talk will then apply that to consciousness. Um, and I'll take my time and we'll certainly get through the first part and we'll see how we do with the second part. Um, OK, so we all know interpretations of quantum theory. Um, so just in a nutshell, for those who are not from foundations of physics, I think it's fair to say that they are all tools which aim to provide metaphysical and or conceptual clarity to the quantum formalism. And usually they have some sort of satisfaction criteria in mind, like a particular notion of, you know, particular ontology you'd like to have or something like that. And what matters for this talk is that they're not only interpretations, but they are in fact also modifications. So almost all of them propose some unique modifications of the quantum formalism. For example, they leave something away, typical or like major example is the collapse postulate, um, or they add something to the theory. Um, but as you go along this line of examples, for example, um, you know, the, the thing they add becomes not so um, trivial, like for example, in the relational quantum theory, what's the precise change to the formalism? Um, but it is there. And we'll make use of that later on, at least in one case. Okay. So what I'm interested in, in the first part of the talk, is the future of physics. That meaning, meaning the development of new fundamental physical theory. And that's, I think it's pretty obvious, even, even so unacknowledged, that um, the, the interpretations play a role for the future of physics. Um, so they guide or motivate research programs that go beyond the physics we have. And here's just a bunch of examples. Um, so the first three, I'm pretty sure that they're, they're certainly true. With the last two you can argue um, and there are more i should say so for example algebraic quantum field theory is a research program that tries to put quantum field theory on solid grounding and and it's based in some sort of interpretation which has observables and a lot of um, a c star algebra of them to be precise beyond the, the quantum field theory itself and certainly beyond quantum field, uh, standard model approaches in quantum field theory they're usually based in some sort of ensemble interpretation reading of Feynman diagrams um, it's probably like this is probably not a good thing to do, but anyway, it's the fact that people think that way. String theory arguably is grounded in some sort of many worlds ideas, um, and the list goes on. So that's one direction. What about the other direction? What about the relevance of future of physics or so new things we either propose or might eventually find um, for interpretations? And I think it's also here pretty straightforward that newly proposed physical theories might have some implications for interpretations. So for example, it could be that a new physical theory um, implies certain modifications to the mathematical formalism of quantum theory that is incompatible with one or the other interpretation. Um, or it could also be that a new physical theory leads to certain like it leads to certain impossibilities concerning ontological interpretations that conflict with one or the other in, um, interpretation of quantum theory. And what I want to do in this talk is two things. First, I want to explain um, a more systematic connection between the future of physics, if you like an attitude concerning the future of physics, and one specific interpretation. Um, and if I do my job rightly, like you'll all be a bit pissed because I don't think you'd like the result, um, but you'll have to live with it, or it's wrong, we'll see. And the second thing I'll then do is I'll, um, I'll apply that to consciousness. And so this is an interdisciplinary talk. So I thought a lot about which level of detail to present in the talk, and I've gone to almost no formula, except on one slide where I have um, but I realized that for the physicists in the room, this might be a bit uncomfortable. So what I did is, if you look at the very, oh, you can see that here in the room, but in the Zoom um, feed, you can see at the top right of the, of the talk, I put a tiny URL, you can type it in. Um, it's, yeah, so if, if anyone can move the small window, we could see it, but don't worry. Um, and if you click on that, you'll see the preprint, and you can follow what I'm saying along with the formalism. So if if no formulas makes you uncomfortable, it does me to some extent, then please go ahead and do that. Um, still, I thought it's best to really stick with, a, um, with the absolute um, minimal formalism to make sure that the talk is actually easy to understand. Okay, so let's jump in. So, the, oh, and I should say this, this is work together with Kobe Kramnitzer, a wonderful collaboration. Um, I'm not sure if Kobe is here, but he was supposed to be here. Also couldn't make it for personal reasons. Um, yeah, thanks Kobe for being part of this. Um, okay. So let's jump in. So what's the mathematics we use in order to show that result? And that is basically the mathematics, if you like, of so-called dynamically possible trajectories. So that's a term from, from mathematical physics. And that sort of describes in colloquial language the solutions a theory gives 
um, for all sorts of circumstances. That's a nice object to look at because if you know the spaces in which the states live, um, you can write down or, or work with these solutions without caring about the actual math that's being used in the laws of the theory. So it allows you to sort of look at much of what a theory says without like having to tie down in any specific mathematical or non-mathematical formulation. But what does it mean for us? So for us it means the following. So let's look at the left-hand side on quantum, quantum theory first. For us it means um, we're giving a system and in quantum theory that means we're given a Hilbert space and a Hamiltonian. And so what quantum theory then does is um, it specifies for us a time evolution and that's just what I draw here. So we start with an initial value, then we have this time evolution. So time is here. And, to, and sort of the set of dynamically possible trajectories is just the set of all time evolutions for all initial values for all systems. Something very large, but we can make sense of it and operate with it. And this notion is nice because we can also apply it to more fundamental physical theories. Um, um, in this case, we have some space X, which we don't know what it is. And we have some parameter, which I just call T as well, but it might not be time. And still the theory is giving us some sort of trajectories in the space S, X, some sort of variations. Um, and we can, in principle, at least study the set of those. So what matters for something to be more fundamental physical theory as to compare maybe a more a less fundamental physical theory? Well, what matters is that we have some way of going from whatever the theory ends up saying um, to the, the dynamical trajectories of quantum theory. So we have some sort of limiting case or a special case or some completely novel notion, which we don't know so far. And that's essential for this whole thing. So the question in this sort of limiting case procedure is um, basically, like if I take my more fundamental physical theory of choice and I go back to non-relativistic Schrodinger equation, um, what happens? Yeah? And so there's basically two choices. The choice number one is that nothing happens. So that's what we actually had on the other slide. So I just get the very same evolutions I have so far given the system and its Hamiltonian. The second choice is that something happens. And that's what in physics we usually call correction terms or corrections. So that means I get at small changes. I mean, in principle, it could also be large changes, but usually small changes of the evolution. Um, and they might just allow me to test the more fundamental physical theory. And that all connects to what Catalina has just said, and we'll see how in a minute. Okay, so just for the philosophers in the room, I want to be very explicit. I mean, most people know it anyway, but just not to lose anyone. So what does it mean to say that something is, or, so how, what's this terminology of correction? So I'm going to say more fundamental physical theory specifies correction, non-relativistic Schrodinger evolution, if and only if it doesn't um, posit any changes to the matter. So case number one, oh, yeah. So case number one is here, so we have no changes, yeah? so there are no corrections. Case number two is we have changes, so there are corrections. You can't see a gray line in here, but you get the, the idea, I think. Okay, so of course, I mean, this whole debate only is interesting because we don't actually know what more fundamental physical theory is true, right? So we have a, a bunch of proposals, and personally, I'd be surprised if any single one of them is true as it stands might be, but it could also be something more, um, something yet very different from the ones we usually study. So the question is, okay, so how, like, how does what I've said so far allow us to say anything um, if we don't know the more fundamental physical theory? And the answer is the following. So um, remember how in this limiting case, we have either corrections or no corrections. So what we have to do in order to take this into account, at least formally, we have to basically say, well, um, if the more fundamental physical theory specifies corrections to the Schrödinger equation, it could be that these corrections depend on the actual state or trajectory of the more fundamental physical theory. That's just a possibility, which might or might not be the case. And so the point of that slide is, is if we want to at least formally open our formalism for non-knowledge about the fundamental physical theory, we need to work with a stochastic evolution in here instead of just um, uh, evolution in Hilbert space itself. So the point of this slide is really, um, if we want to get a handle on, like not yet make any specific statement, if we want to get a handle on, you know, what more fundamental physical theories could imply, then we need to work not with an evolution of a single element of Hilbert space here, but we work, need to work with a probabilistic evolution. So you start with one vector of Hilbert space, and then you have a stochastic process, much like in other domains of math, which basically then leads to a probability distribution over vectors of Hilbert spaces. 
I hope that, so that's kind of important. So what, what I'm doing here is I'm not making a definite claim, I'm changing the formalism from having just trajectory in H to having stochastic processes over H. I hope that works. I mean, I hope it, I hope got the point, the point across. Okay, so let's just have a quick poll out of interest, um, going back to this notion of correction. So who of you think that there will eventually be, a, be corrections to the non-relativistic Schrödinger equation? given the Hamiltonian of a system. So I take any sort of system, I take the Hamiltonian we believe now is a true Hamiltonian, I get a time evolution in Hilbert space. Who of you thinks that eventually, as we go on with science, there will be correction to that? Raise your hand if you do. Yeah. Oh man, you're, you're a funny crowd. Yeah. We've got other, others behind you as well. Oh yeah, good, yeah. <laughs> oh, nice, yeah. This one already has raised the hand, good. Um, who thinks there will not be corrections? So Lev Weidmann, for example, will think that, yeah, okay. So just taking crack. I, I noted it down. So later on, I'll, I'll, I'll take you up on that. There's one more there. Put the hand up for that. Yeah, it's good. Put the hand up. Okay, so let's just go to the one formal slide I have in this whole talk. So that's the slide on dynamical collapse models. So they have been introduced already, or specific variants have already been introduced by Angelo Bassi on Monday and just now by Catalina. So what's a dynamical collapse model? So there are three main tenets. So first, a dynamical collapse model um, replaces the single wave function in Hilbert space by a stochastic process. So mathematically, that means we now have a random variable that goes from some sample space to Hilbert space. But sort of intuitively speaking, or in meaning, that means that we now, instead of one single wave function, we now have a probability of having this wave function or that wave function, and so forth. So there's an additional source of indeterminacy in stochastic processes. That's the first move of dynamical colors models. The second move is that we um, modify um, Schrödinger equation. So first we have to make it an equation for a stochastic process. So it becomes a, um, a stochastic differential equation. And second, we take the original Schrödinger part and now we add new parts. And what we add is a nonlinear part and a stochastic part. And I've written down the most general form these nonlinear and stochastic parts can have down here. I won't discuss it now for the reason of time. Just roughly speaking, why is this one nonlinear? Well, because these little l's here have two, two, two sides in there. So there's something going on that has more than one psi, and therefore it's a nonlinear term. Um, so this is basically the, the most general evolution equation you can have. And then the third ingredient in dynamical collapse models is that this whole business is made in such a way that the stochastic process converges to what we previously called measurement results um, dynamically in most cases. This is the sort of idea. Um, and I want to define, I, need to, I just want to define what I mean by dynamical colors model and what follows. And here's the definition. By the way, um, in Zoom, there's all sorts of colors to make this nicer to see. So you're just getting the black and white version, more or less, um, for some reason. But anyway, so what's the definition? Well, the definition I'm going to use for dynamical colors model is that a stochastic process so that meaning, you know, a random variable like here, is a dynamical colors model, model if and only if, A, the induced density matrix of that stochastic process satisfies this equation here. So it's also the induced density matrix of some solution of the equation I have up here. That's the first condition. And the second condition, which makes it interesting, is that I'm requiring that for this very solution, this second and third term together, which are often called collapse terms, they need to be non-zero, yeah? So this sum is non-zero. So why do I define it like this? Well, the reason, so it was wonderful that I had a talk after Catalina. The reason is that I want to have a definition that does not enforce Markovianity. So the study of non-Markovian collapse models is just beginning, and I, I think it's fair to say that we don't know the mass general form now. So I'm playing this trick. I'm working with a, I'm working with a form um, that we usually have in Markovian contexts, and defining it in such a way that you can also have non-Markovian um, evolution equations. If you wonder why that is possible, like this is, so this is possible precisely because of the main ingredient in the main theorem that I'll show later. Um, please ask me later if you're interested. Okay, so we now know what a dynamical collapse model is, and now I can present you our result. And here it is. So we're going to assume that special or general relativity is valid, which is just basically saying no signal. Then here's the theorem. I'll explain it now, and then I'll read it now, and I'll explain it on the next slide. So our theorem is, Two leading order in time, that means linear in time. Um, the induced stochastic evolution of any fundamental physical theory, that's the pink curve we had on the other slide, is a dynamical collapse model if and only if the theory gives correction to the non-relativistic Schrodinger equation. So it's pretty general. Oh, sorry, I can't. 
So, okay, so what does it mean? Let's, let's unfold it in terms of an argument. So, and I'm gonna just make it about your beliefs because um, you gave me your beliefs when we had the poll, so I can't take you out. So if you think that special generativity are valid, um, basically if you think that there's no signaling in the usual sense of the word, um, and if you furthermore think that eventually we'll have some correction to the Schrödinger equation, however small, so this is what I would just call if you think that physics isn't done, well then in virtue of the theorem, whose proof you can find in the paper I've linked up here, you have bought into the mathematics of dynamical columns models and thereby objective columns models, which is just a more general term, to leading order in time. There's nothing you can do about it. It's a mathematical term. What does it mean? Well, it means that because there's no, and now we come back to this modification thing I had on the first slide, because there's this sort of almost uniqueness of modification, because there's no other interpretation that shares this mathematical formalism, so far at least, um, you already bought into the objective columns interpretation of quantum mechanics. So if you want to put it with a huge simplification, so basically what this all shows is that if you believe that physics isn't done, well then you also have to believe in the collapse interpretation, dynamical collapse or objective collapse interpretation. And if you don't do that, you're not a rational agent. So who voted for corrections earlier? <laughs> well, in any case, okay. Just in a nutshell, so how are we, how are we doing in time actually? Um, you've got uh, a lot of time. Okay, yeah. Minutes. Yeah, I mean, I want to get to the question. So just in a nutshell, how does the proof of that work? Well. Base, so the, the upshot is we make use of a lot of very nice results that have already been there, going back to the original Lindblad equation in 1976, which in my opinion should have deserved the Nobel Prize. Um, much work that has been done in order to understand how you can actually propose nonlinear modifications of quantum theory without violating special relativity. And in particular, one paper in 2013 that was um, by Angelo Bassi, Detlef Dürer, and Günther Hinrichs, where they proved Okay, so I need to say that for the mathematical physicists in the room. So the, the 76 paper by Lindblad and also um, these three authors, three authors which are wonderful but hard to pronounce, um, that showed that basically gave, a, gave an equation for the most general, the most general equation that you can have if you have a completely positive quantum dynamical semigroup that describes the time evolution. And the, the important result which we work with, which was proved by by, Detle, uh, by Angelo Bassi and Detlef and Günther Hinrichs. In 2013 was a result which replaced one of the major assumptions in the 76 papers, um, namely the complete positivity, by another assumption, namely Markovianity. And just for those in the room who are not mathematicians, so Markov assumption is two things. First, time homogeneity and then a Markov condition. The Markov condition really encodes this idea that you, you, like if you know more about the past, you don't learn more about the future. But the important part is like you also have to like time homogeneity is a separate assumption and the two come together when we usually say speak of the Markov assumption. So what do Kobe and I do? Well, we prove that the Markov condition, that is that latter part is not necessary. And how do we prove that? It's actually like it's um, I, I found it a very difficult proof. It's a couple of pages long. So we prove constructively that for any stochastic process which you take, there's in fact a Markov process which has the same expectation value as the original process. That's something that wasn't known previously. And if you take that and you plug all the pieces together, that already gives you the theory. So what that does is basically, so we're still left with this time homogeneity assumption. I'm not sure if that can ever be removed. But what we can now do, we can now place it in its, or put it in its rightful place. We can now understand that this whole theorem here was in fact telling us something about the leading order evolution of any um, stochastic process, if you like, or of, and then apply it to fundamental physical theories. Okay. Technical remark in case Adrian is here. So, so not so much our proof, but, <laughs> <laughs> oh, but very uh, yeah, it's coming here. It's coming. Here. Uh, so not so much our proof, but the theorems we rely, we rely on in the proof. So our proof is literally only about stochastic processes. Yeah, like it's just sort of um, it's, yeah. There's no there's actually not much quantum theory or there's no quantum theory in the main proof. But the theorems we rely on they make use of some general properties of quantum theory. For example, the tensor product construction or how local state of a composite systems are defined. Um, and it doesn't, so just for, as a side remark, it doesn't make use of others. Like for example, nobody assumes the Schrodinger equation directly. But if you of course start modifying with these general properties, then just logically speaking, our result ceases to apply. And that is for example, the case for Adrian's proposal, which we also, he also showed us on Tuesday, I believe it was. So that's changing something and therefore not making our result apply. What does it mean? That's a good question. And um, like 
my personal thing is it, it basically still confuses me. Um, and I don't have the time to say what I mean now unless Adrian asks, so please do, Adrian. Um, but the question is really a question of the sort of thing like, what do we actually know based on, like, like regarding the systems we have tested and experiments when it comes to these structures above? Happy to discuss it later. I don't have a good answer so far. Um, but technically, that's absolutely an important point. Like, you can break our result um, in this sort of way. Okay, let's go to consciousness. Came home is so far, just to repeat again, if you think physics isn't done, I'm not going to read it now, otherwise we're just going to get into that. I don't know, I'll read it later. Uh, thanks very much. So if you believe physics isn't done and you don't believe Avian's model is, you know, like the way to go, which it could be, it's a very interesting proposal, then, um, then you also need to um, believe in the objective college interpretation. So at the very least, I heard that say in some of the talks, at the very least, like it's not an easy at saying, you don't think that makes any sense, or you don't think that's a viable alternative. Okay, anyway, let's go to consciousness, and our original focus was consciousness. So I want now to apply what I told you so far to consciousness. So somehow we're going to have to understand the role fundamental physical theory played in the previous part in terms of theories of consciousness. So let me just review what a theory of consciousness um, is, minimally speaking. So a theory of consciousness, I take it, is some sort of bridge, I'm intentionally unclear that's on, on that slide, between a physical description of things and some sort of description, usually colloquial, you know, has seen the stimulus sort of language of conscious experience. And crucial point, these things are only epistemically distinct um, or only necessarily as epistemically distinct. I'm not making an ontological assumption by portraying things like that. So speaking a little bit more mathematically, let's keep pressing this button. So, what we have is we have some sort of physical states. Usually they're taken from some sort of physical theory, from some sort of natural science, for example, neuroscience on the one hand. And then we have some sort of space or set of states of consciousness on the other hand. And just a quick intermezzo. So I'm not assuming too much here. State of consciousness where really differ from theory to theory. Um, and it could for, have various different meanings. So for example, it could try to describe whether a system or creature is conscious or not. Um, it, in IT, it could, in early IT, it could try to describe how conscious the system is. It could try to describe the content of consciousness. It could try to describe whether a subject has consciously perceived a particular stimulus or not once it was masked. So I'm just being very general here. And this is just to say it could have all sorts of mathematical structure. And there's no, I, I don't think we have any clue of any of the necessary structure we're, we're wanting here. And I'm just, so it could be a set, it could be a line maybe in this kind of thing, it could be a vector space, it could be just like a, a huge collection of probability distributions like in IIT. And all I'm saying is like, when I draw it like this, I mean any of this or any of this. So I'm trying to be as much non-committal non as you can be. Okay, back to the picture. So we have these two, two sorts of states. And what I need to do now, what we also do in the paper, we now need to say something minimal again that allows us to, work, to go further, yeah. So you could, for example, try and say, well, there's a relation between that and that in the mathematical sense of the word. That won't work. I can explain you why in the question times. And the next general thing you can say, and I think that's the way to stick with, is again, just thinking in terms of dynamically possible trajectories, or as I call them here, just co-variations. So you, you could, so basically what we can do is we can say any sort of theory of consciousness whatsoever it gives us two, a space like that and a space like that could just be sets. And then it tells us how changes, you know, with some parameter in a physical state correlate to changes with some parameter in the state of consciousness. So that's the picture. And obviously it's very close to the last picture we had, but that's because it's very general. The idea is, if you, like the idea is if I just work with a, with a co-variations, your theory specifies, I don't have to look at your math. I just have to look at the spaces here, which arguably are meaningful independently of your theory, and I can forget everything else. You give me all the trajectories, I'm, I have something to work with. Okay, so what does, what does this have to do with quantum theory? Well, here's an assumption which Kobe and I make, and the assumption is the following. Well, if you think about neurons, for example, so this is a part of a neuron, part of the, the if you like, the boundary or the membrane of a neuron, it's called a phospholipid bilayer. And this is from Vicky, but this is literally in every single neuroscience 101 book. And the message I'm trying to make here is like this, this is the thing that carries on the action potential, which is certainly important somehow for consciousness, but it's composed of molecules. Every one of these little dots um, is a molecule and every one of these blue things is an ion channel, which is also composed of molecules. 
So the idea is neurons and so forth, they're composed of molecules, molecules and so forth, and molecules and so forth are just quantum objects. So I'm justifying the assumption that all relevant physical states, relevant for a theory of consciousness, that is, sorry to Penrose, like no gravity here, are quantum states. Um, and which is going to work with this assumption? Comment that is not reductionism at all. Reductionism is something much more um, rich than just saying that as like one state has to do with another state or correlates or, yeah, or is another state in a certain sense. Um, okay, so let's go back to these funny pictures which I have throughout the talk. So what that means is if we have a physical state like here, you know, let's say this describing how a part of the brain evolves in time and its neural states. Well, that, oh, you can't see it very well here, but there's blue curves here. Well, that just means, well, for every physical state, we've got a bunch of quantum states, um, which somehow are, or at least mathematically, are the pre-image of that physical state. So what that means is that I had the physical state here before, so and I have all trajectories sort of on that level of description. Well, now this assumption I made give me, in principle at least, all trajectory on the quantum um, level. So in other words, if you have a theory of consciousness and it tells me how certain physical trajectories relate to consciousness, um, then I make this assumption and then your theory implies some story about how quantum trajectories and states of consciousness relate. Okay, so that's cool. Um, so now that we have that, we can ask, okay, so what does any such theory have to say about an experiment like that? So that's not an experiment of consciousness, if you're wondering. So that's just a, a physicist being in some lab doing some sort of experiment. Yeah. So in other words, let's pretend some theory of consciousness is true. Um, what would I have to say for that? And that's, um, in a certain sense, so we're asking about purely physical measurements. So we're asking, what does a theory of consciousness say about purely physical measurement, where a purely physical measurement is a measurement where we do not care or know about the state of consciousness of the whole system. So it's arguably true that we live in a world where some theory of consciousness is true. What would it mean in this case? So that's the picture we had before. Now it's a little bit different, but similar. So there's again the, the question, so what if we don't know this part of the story? What if we don't know one of the variables that arguably matter? Well, the only thing it enforces on our side is we have to be, uh, like generalize our formalism a little bit on that side. So it could be, it could also not be, I should say this, like linear non-stochastic evolution is a, is a special case of stochastic evolution, just non there isn't any stochastic, uh, any stochastic term in the equation. But sort of the generalization we have to introduce in order to capture this scenario is really just saying, well, look, it could be that for any single initial value here, we could have several initial values here, which lead to slightly different physical trajectories there. That's the sort of story we're looking at. Okay, so the message I'm making is that, so the important message here is, and the story which I have on the left-hand side is really depending on the theory of consciousness depending on what it says. So the message I'm saying is when we're concerned with purely physical measurements, we have a theory of consciousness and that implies some sort of stochastic evolution and the evolution differs from theory to theory. And as you can guess, we're gonna look at a major assumption now, which di distinguishes two major classes of such um, evolutions. And the assumption is the closure of the physical. So definition, a theory of consciousness describes the physical as closed if and only if it does not posit any changes to the trajectories of the underlying physical theory. So without our quantum assumption, well, that just means so the theory can't make any changes. So if, if neuroscience says, in principle, the brain runs like that, the theory of consciousness can change that story if it wants to satisfy, if it wants to describe the physical that's closed. Look, but of course, um, so let's look at it in a little bit more detail first. So we have two cases. First case, the theory does, uh, the, a theory does describe the physical as closed. Arguably, all major theories want to describe the physical as closed. So by, in virtue of the definition, that means we don't have changes to the trajectories of the underlying physical theory. And that means here's our physical story, and here's our story with a theory of consciousness, and it just means like these two are the same. We didn't make any changes here. And we can immediately say what that implies for collapse. Well, it implies if there's collapse, then not because of consciousness. Because consciousness doesn't make any change to a physical um, evolution. Alternative case, what happens if the theory does not describe the physical as closed? Well, in this case, we have some trajectories here and the theory of consciousness somehow modifies them in some sense. We don't know how, we don't know when or, or why or something, but it just does. And this is an example. So this is, for example, the case, depending on what you, but this is, for example, the case if there's a causal influence from consciousness to physics. But of course, I don't want to introduce causal language because causality is something 
very complicated, or at least there are various different options. So I'd rather just speak about these trajectories. That's one of the motivations. Okay, that's it. So now we just have to put the pieces together. Okay, so we had the, here's again the definition of the closure of the physical, which you've read before. No changes to the underlying physical theories. Then we have this um, assumption, which I introduced, that all relevant states are in fact quantum states. Um, and therefore we can immediately that translate that in terms of the, into the correction language we had in the first part of the talk. So if a theory does not describe, um, if a theory does the, describes the physical as closed, then it does not describe any corrections to misuse that term um, of the non-relativistic Schrodinger equation. I think that, that should be pretty straightforward. I should emphasize this, this whole story also works if you have collapse dynamics on the physical side of things alone, but let's go to that in the question time if, you, if you're wondering about that. Okay, that's it. Then immediately we get a corollary, corollary um, to our last theorem. So we again assume that special general relativity, general relativity theory is valid. Well then now we just replace the one term in the theorem with another term. So we get the following corollary. Um, we, we now know as a theorem that to leading order in time, the induced stochastic evolution of any theory of consciousness, again, the pink curves we had, um, is a dynamical collapse model, if and only if the theory does not describe the physical as closed. Okay, so that's the theorem again. So what does it mean? Let's now first, um, so let's just spell it out carefully. So what, so it means that to, to first order in time, that means that your theory implies something and you're only looking at the linear part, for purely physical measurement, that was important. Um, every theory of consciousness which does not describe the physical as closed is a dynamic cause model. That's the um, conclusion we have arrived at. What does it imply? Well, there are several sorts of implications. I thought these two might be interesting. So first, um, it means that in the context of consciousness, the study of collapse models, like Dave and Kelvin did, is as important as studying theories which do not describe the physical as closed. So you might think, well, it, it depends on what you think about the latter, right? But if you think that's an important thing to do, then you need to be open to study collapse models. There's no way around it. Mathematics force you to. Um, so that's one implication. Another one, which I like more, and which I just thought about very recently is, well, that this, well, like if we try sort of, if we take that at face value, what that shows us is that if the physical is not closed, then consciousness resolves superpositions. So that's a, that's a more interesting one, and that's one I'd, I'd, I'd be interested in discussing. Kobe and I haven't had the chance so far to discuss this. So this is kind of saying, like, if the physical isn't closed, the measurement problem goes away on its own, just because of some math. Okay, quick note on collapse operator, because that pops up in you guys' work, and because we've also discussed this. Um, so the collapse operators in the collapse model depend on the theory of consciousness. That's just sort of a, a consequence of the theorem, or of the proof, to be more precise. Um, and there is no reason whatsoever why you would have a preferred role for space. So, um, in other words, it's very likely that if you plug your favor or maybe even the true theory of consciousness into this theorem, that um, you get something that doesn't is not none of those class. You know, it's not your W C S L D P or Mobil. Yeah. Um, and so that, of course, is interesting. Um, it opens up a completely new space, and it's so wonderful that Catalina was before me because it opens up in particular the space of non-Markovian collapse model that's now being started to be explored. Um, and it raises this question, so what is, like, what then do we learn from these experimental um, procedures that have been carried out? I mean, they are meaningful in any case. The question is, like, what do they imply for the specific model that comes out of your favorite theory of consciousness? Okay, that's the talk. Conclusions. I've, so I want to emphasize this. I've presented a mathematical result. There was a few conceptual things we had to do just to get into the right realm, but it's basically a mathematical result. Um, you can see it here. Here's, by the way, the full URL if someone wants to check it out. And that connects the closure of the physical on the one hand with the number of collapse models. Um, I've just discussed a few consequences. There are others one could discuss, but I think the following two, which we talked about, um, are of interest for this conference. So first of all, I really like this. So this is like a little bit of a provocation. So if you think that physics isn't done, you need to believe in the collapse, in the, in the objective collapse interpretation. Um, and the second one, more for this conference um, specifically. So if there's no closure of the physical, um, you know, just in the universe, we're, we're making it logical now, well, then consciousness resolves the superpositions by its own. You don't have to do anything about it. Um, yeah, that's the talk. Thanks very much for the attention. Yeah.
questions? Ah, I this, yeah. Oh, sorry, I am I, very difficult um, I, for me, but the uh, consciousness and, uh, and the neuron is yeah. my ma major. So I, I would like to comment the, the, what is your meaning of consciousness, mm. or personal consciousness, yeah. or or I'm just going consciousness, with consciousness. consciousness. What um, what do you measure mm -hmm. the consciousness? The I cannot understand the meaning. Yeah. Consciousness measure. Yeah. Oh, uh, I cannot understand. Yeah. And the to uh, I think physics can um, describe the movement only. Mm -hmm. So consciousness is not to, uh, more consists of many factors, not move only move. Yeah. But um, but physics can describe only movement, I think. So uh, consciousness is, is that this is a part of the small part of the uh, description uh, experiment. Uh, ex mm, I think that uh, this conclusion is only from the point of view, the movement point of view. But the mm, other so point cannot yeah. explain yeah. this. Yeah. So I think it's, it's a question consciousness. which is completely independent of my talk. Um, I, I'm just going to go with consciousness is equal to phenomenal consciousness. That's a technical term. Um, and I'm happy to discuss this, what you say. But I think it's really a question for the whole field. You know, how do you measure consciousness? And I think the only thing important to say there is that there's very, very much refined methodology, methodology that has been developed by excellent people. Um, and that's just something you need to look at. But thanks for the question. But very, it. very interesting. Yeah, I, I have you. to yeah. study more, more, more. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, question at the back. Yeah. Uh, could you uh, a nice talk? Could you please uh, clarify the statement you have proven uh, about the uh, non-Markovian process being uh, same as Markovian process? Or, uh, yeah. 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 So the statement is the following, you take any stochastic process in the mathematical sense of that term, and then I can give you constructively a stochastic process which has the very same expectation value, but is Markovian. That's the precise statement. Yeah. Don is nodding his head so much that it, maybe it's obvious, I hope not. <laughs> no, I'm, uh, well, I'm, I'm proposing a Markovian model myself, so I like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's completely yeah, really general. Then. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, would you call, would you consider my the theory that we're working on a collapse model? Yeah. So yeah, so I think that um, that all these theories which do not like so first of all I think that you know the theories which are not physicalist in nature should probably not describe the physical as closed. So that's also in my opinion true for IIT. Like I don't see that the clear reason why it should do that. And then of course our result would apply. But what you do is like looks like a collapse model to first order anyway. Okay. And, and the interesting question is then, of course, like, so what, what is the collapse term? And, you know, or maybe more generally, like, does it make sense to think about this first order thing in more detail to make some sort of connection to the physics, um, you know, which is, um, yeah, at least maybe more amenable to some sort of test. So maybe, maybe just something which I'm not, like, not firm about, but one thing, one interesting line of thought is, like, if your theory has anything special, special symmetry, for example, mathematically speaking, special symmetry, special mathematical feature, that, that, that is not getting lost if you take like the first order of the time evolution, then you might have something interesting to study with respect to collapse models. You know, okay. it comes from your theory. Um, it's just a mathematical task then, but maybe there's some, you know, like I think if we're, if we're open for more general collapse sort of Models, models. There might be interesting effects of mathematical structure that have not yet been studied. Yeah. Okay, so we've got a question from the Zoom audience. Okay. Go back. So, Lucian, hi. Uh, hi. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the talk. Um, it, it seems to me it's possible that that um, the uh, collapse models are are sort of the correct uh, um, effective theory at some level, but then it's still possible that if you go Sort of deeper than than that's not the case anymore. And and, yeah. and the thing that makes me say that is is um, you know the theory of quantum gravity. It looks like you get uh, indefinite causal structure, so you sort of fundamentally lose a notion of time. 
Mm -hmm. So fundamentally, you'd lose the notion of time evolution. Um, So you couldn't talk about past models in the way you do. But if you go to some effective uh, domain where you you do have uh, evolution in time, then then it seems likely that class yeah. models would uh, would become the uh, the right effective description. Does that seem reasonable to you? This is yeah. Thanks very much. So this is another way of just saying what what Kobe and I want to show. So maybe there's one quantifier in there which you know all the math delivers, but this is exactly it. You know we're saying that like effectively like what like whatever you do, you know, if it has some sort of mean or like some sort of implications for the non-relativistic Schrodinger evolution of the system we've studied previously, if there's any implication, then effectively it looks like a Connors model. And it's completely like the whole thing is completely compatible with um, there not being collapse in any fundamental sense in the theory you started with. It's really just a first order th- sort of statement. Okay. Thank yeah. So thanks very much. Yeah. Okay, so we'll do Spencer then, Dave. Um, yeah, so, so yesterday we were talking a lot about Wigner's enemy in a box. Yeah. Um, you know, we suppose that you know, we have this technologically advanced box, we do this advanced measurement at the end. And I was thinking that if we didn't see interference effects when we did this uh, experiment, that this would imply some like, modification of quantum mechanics. You know, maybe we have to conclude that you know, consciousness resolves superpositions, or at least that there's some objective collapse going on in the box. Um, do you feel like your, your theorems, um, are, you know, essentially talking about the same thing? Um, I think that the answer is there, like, so the answer really depends on the collapse model under consideration. You know, like, is it one of the ones we usually study? Is it Dave's and Calvin's? You know, what does it have to do with consciousness and so forth? So I don't think there's a direct connection. All we're saying is like, if you modify quantum theory, um, you, you're easily doing something that ends up being a collapse model anyway. Yeah. I hope that helps a bit. Yeah. Yeah, a couple of things. Um, one, I think I heard you say, although it's not on this slide, that if you have an objective collapse interpretation, you don't have closure of the physical. Oh, yeah. We, you didn't say that? No. Yeah. Okay. So it would be very nice if we can link these things up and say physics isn't done and consciousness resolves superposition. That would be great. It would have been very convenient. <laughs> yeah. Okay, but by, by your lines, objective collapse interpretations, many of them do involve closure of the uh, physical, like yeah. standard, standard spontaneous collapse models. I would go further. I would say that the, 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 the definition of closure of the physical is meaningless if you just talk about physical theories. So it's just so you know, like that's why I usually use this term, this a theory of consciousness. Could you go to your definition of yeah, closure? Absolutely. So I know that in a previous talk I was very suspicious of your yeah. definition of this notion. Yeah. I didn't get the exact definition. So let me just go to the so so this is so the, 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 the main thing I want to do here is a make it something that's a definition about a theory of consciousness um and not um about a physical theory. One weird thing about this is it's all relative to some physical theory, so yeah. I mean, a theory of physical is not closed or not. Yeah. Absolutely. So we've got one physical theory, and then here's some other theory. This theory says the physical is closed relative to that theory. Yeah. So the, the underlying it's not really an absolute notion of yeah. describing the physical as yeah. closed. So this is this is so the intention is to make something not absolute but relative to a theory of consciousness. The underlying presupposition is that every theory of consciousness has something which we can call its underlying physical theory. That's just you know like it might be a neuroscience theory, but that's just just where it gets its physical states from. And I'm saying this, yeah, I'm saying it like this because like if you want to make it absolute, you know, like obviously physics isn't closed, right? We're trying to understand how dark matter wind particles interact with a known physics or something. So like at least the, the physical theories we have are, are we look for want to find new causal influences. I mean, there's also question, what is going to be the underlying physical theory? I mean, just say for yeah. Kelvin's and my theory, yeah. what's the underlying physical theory? Well, you could just say it's just the Schrodinger yeah, equation. Schrodinger. I don't know. Yeah. You could also say, well, it's a collapse model where physical collapses happen under certain complex physical circumstances. Those are actually yeah. the physical trajectories. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. So you'd have to make a choice. Like, for example, um, I think the Stuart Hameroff model is a model which um, describes the physical as closed, as at, least, at least as it's usually presented, because the collapse has a physical origin and they just say consciousness sits along on it, like rides along on the collapse. 
Another way to think about this definition is it ties closure of the physical to consciousness. Mm -hmm. By definition, you might think closure of the physical is a much more general notion. Yeah. It could be violated because consciousness plays a role, but it yeah. could also yeah. be violated because you know, yeah. magic plays a yeah. role or yeah. who knows what yeah. plays so a role. So, that's what yeah. so again, it's, it's so, yeah, again, it's intentional. And the idea is like, like sort of as far as this definition goes, it's really a property of a theory of consciousness and that only. Like you might have to use another definition, yeah. but I, I do think all these yeah. very idiosyncratic definitions yeah. at least change the upshot of the, uh, that, the talk. Yeah, that could be. Yeah, quite considerably. Yeah, so. yeah. but this is so. I mean, the, so the, the upshot. So I mean, you do this carefully, and Stefan and I do this carefully in one of the paper. You know, um, so it's the next slide. So you know, like you can start with your own definition, and you can then wonder how it relates to ours. And so, for example, if the physical isn't causally, clo causally closed, and you mean you have in mind that causality is fundamental, then it's easy to show that your definition implies ours. So, meaning that the true theory of consciousness then that describes this that like does not describe the physical as closed in, in our sense. But um, yeah, so just to emphasize this, so the, the maybe I'm not sure if it went wrong, and I'm really open to criticism. But the idea was to like let's just look at theories and let's try to bracket everything else if possible. But for example, how have you excluded the thesis say that uh, that magic effect consciousness doesn't affect physics, but magic affects? I, I'd say like if you if you if we want to contemplate contemplate that thesis in scientific context, we have to make up our mind what a theory of magic is, you know. Mm -hmm. Like in the sense of a theory of consciousness, and then we can think about whether this definition could be applied. You've got this striking claim that if not, if physics isn't closed, then oh, yeah. wow, consciousness yeah, so, yeah. resolves yeah. superpositions. But yeah, okay. It's actually, so, you haven't, you haven't yeah. ruled out that magic resolves yeah. superpositions. Yeah. Or... So I apologize. So this is really something I did just, I think, I did yesterday in the evening. Or two. So this is actually like, so I put these approximate signs, and every and whenever else I stated, I say it's a simplification. So that's really only a take home message. So I want to get away from the idea that this is a meaningful statement if you don't specify the theory. So this is okay. I apologize. So this is too like this is too polemic. Okay, so this is this is with a very proprietary notion then. Yeah. No, no, no. physical in the I, I would just say these are not these are like sort of you know like um, take home messages that are simplifications that actually mean what I've presented. Okay. So we've got two questions. We'll start with Adrian Kent, then we'll go to Ian Durham. Uh, thanks, Janice. That was a I re really intriguing thought uh, to talk um, and, and very very nice. Um, can I can I try and help with the your confusion on the, on yeah, the point of my way. Yeah, yeah. Because um, I think it, I think it's of interest to anybody who's trying to think about uh, these questions. Um, let's start on things that we clearly agree on. Consciousness is a way in which nature extracts information from, it seems at the moment, from quantum systems. Um, if we, if we assume we're fundamentally a quantum system. Um, and by the way, gravity is another way in which nature seems to extract information in the form of gravi local gravitational fields from quantum systems. So the, que the question you want to ask is, what are the most general ways of extracting information from quantum systems? Uh, and generalized measurements, which is roughly what collapse models are built on, are certainly a, they're the best way we know. Um, but any postulate for a, a way of extracting information from quantum systems that only depends on events in the past light cone yeah. mm -hmm. is, is logically consistent and by construction will not, vi will not violate superluminal signaling. Yeah. Um, yeah. It will generally lead you, give you a theory that doesn't have a sensible non-relativistic mm -hmm. limit because the light cone, the light cone constraint was, was sort of crucial to your construction and, you, and there isn't really a good non-relativistic way of talking about superluminal signaling mm -hmm. Uh, as a, as a limit of that, uh, but does that does that help? So there's, so, there's a way around these so, no so signaling theorems it, that uses uses what seems like a natural construction in the context of relativity. So, and so the dis oh, sorry, sorry, yeah. The disappointing answer is that you know I think that what you said initially that consciousness or and or gravity are ways of um, getting information out of a quantum system. These are interesting hypotheses to me. Um, yeah. about which I've not thought so far, and I'd like to think about them, but it's not something I would initially agree upon just like that. So no, sure. I'm, I'm open to the fact that if I, if I share these hypotheses, then your way of framing quantum theory might be the best one. I'm very open to that fact. Um, it's just like at present, I haven't traveled that journey, so I'd have to travel it, you know, and understand how that is a better way than, than, than everything else. And that's, that's fine, yeah. Great. Okay, well, I look yeah. forward to it. Continuing. Yeah, thanks very much. I, I'm sorry that I, you know, maybe maybe in, in this time or when I give the, the tenth talk, I have a better answer. I'll let you know. 
so you don't have to attend the talk. I'll, I'll shoot you, but so far I don't have better. Well, I'm telling for other reasons, but uh, <laughs> yeah. thanks. So, Thank fine. you. Yeah, yeah. All right, last one from Ian. Um, so just a uh, quick clarification. So um, Dave's question sort of raised it. I, I, I want to clarify some of your answers to Dave. So if I understand the closure of the physical right, what you mean is that if you have a theory of consciousness, that theory of consciousness, at least, I guess if it's a valid theory in your, your view, it's going to be built on some, um, it's going to have some physical ontology underneath it. And so closure of the physical is that it doesn't, it doesn't, it won't affect any of the dynamics of the of that physical ontology that's below it, meaning it won't change the the laws that govern the dynamics of that ontology. I would agree if you just leave the word ontology out of it. Okay. But but so just to give you so literally one example or one like the starting point of thinking about this, this comes from your book, Dave. So in your book, you say somewhere um, closure of the physical roughly means like you, you say something and then I, I read from it. You say literally something like. The close the, the physical laws from a closed system. That's what I always thought about when I read the closure of the physical. And that is sort of a statement which you know underlies the, this way of looking at it. So you do something and it's a new theory, and you do it in such a way that the physical laws still are a closed system. That's that's my way of thinking. Now, your question is very good because most people like they talk about they have all sorts of they call it cause closure of the physical, completeness of the physical, sometimes even closure of the physical. But in philosophy, they mean an ontological assumption. They mean an assumption about our world and what holds in our world. And my, I have my, so my, I have two, uh, two reactions. So the first is, what do you mean by causality? What do you, what are the causal relata? Um, and I forgot the third question, but there's sort of like if you just say it like that, um, there's, it's just a not very precise statement. If for someone that wants to translate it to what it means for theory of consciousness, and then the second answer is, if you look at what many of the main authors say. These definitions of theirs, which I would claim is imprecise, at least like from, from the perspective of our project, what that implies for theories of consciousness, they say stuff which then implies this definition. So, for example, um, Jack Wong Kim or, or, um, or Jackson, they say stuff which, yeah, the closure of the physical implies that any event that, explainable, that is explainable at all is explainable by natural science. And that's a statement. That still has this open role for what an explanation is, and Jackson has a very specific understanding of that. But then, at least from that, you can work your way and end up basically in something similar, or like in a in a statement that is basically that, just without formalism. And Stefan and I do that in a paper, so I'm happy to share. Of course, that like the in the end, I mean, if we're if we're independent of these authors, right? So so what I'm saying is, I think this way of framing is an implication of what many people think is important in a debate. If we're just very general and we're asking what is the relation between this ontological assumption, which basically says every physical effect, so that means every physical event that is an effect has a sufficient physical cause, what is the relation between that and our definition? I think that, like, if we're really general, there is no logical connection just because the notion of cause is so non trivial. Um, yeah, but upshot is my, my, my claim would be that our definition captures what many people find essential in this debate. But they, that claim maybe one. And just maybe one, like, so what we, like what we wanted to do is really have something that, that just targets a property of a theory of consciousness, nothing else. Maybe you should have called it differently, but that's what. Yeah. I have more questions, but I'll ask you later. Yeah. Can I start with something really quickly? Physics isn't done there for objective collapse interpretation. I wonder if that's just slightly too strong. Yeah. What if the correct physical theory is Bowman mechanics? Except yeah. the wave function, yeah. which the particles are floating yeah. around on, just yeah. every so often just does really uninteresting, boring little yeah. collapses. Yeah. So it seems yeah. like maybe it shouldn't be. That, that's yeah. a Bowman yeah. interpretation. Yeah. So maybe it needs to be objective collapses happen or something. Yeah, that's a good point. And it goes back to this very first slide where I said, you know, like you can, pick, you can look at the math and pick out the right interpretation. And of course, like this is just a contingent fact about the interpretation we have now. Like, of course, every, like many interpretations could just add further terms to the Schrodinger equation. And then that statement would be wrong, and then that would be wrong. But that's just a you know take home message anyway. So as Dave pointed out, don't take it too seriously. This is also kind of quantum physics isn't done. I mean, just so you're an Everett theorist who thinks that uh, physics isn't done, because yeah. there's going to be all kinds of amazing stuff. But yeah. 
It's all going to be kind of had a relative equation earlier. Well, you had a relativity assumption earlier. Yeah. So it's like yeah. relativity assumption plus. Yeah, yeah of course. That, that's what I saw. Okay. Okay. I apologize for me making too, putting too much <laughs> symbols. I'm just saying, like, this is take home messages, you know? Yeah, yeah but I guess everyone going back to which... simple stuff and you can get yeah. it. So Misleading advertising numbers. slogans, yeah. I would say. So, so, Dave, your point about Everett. So, Everett is one of the examples, I think. Like, Lev Feynman, I literally gave a version of Everett of... theorists would still say, oh my God, there's all this amazing quantum gravity yeah. string theory yeah. coming for physics. It's not done. So, I gave a talk, like, yeah. not exactly. This one, but a similar one. Left was in the audience, left white man, and he said, like, I made this poll. Everyone said, Yeah, I think there are corrections, except left. And he got very emotional and said, No, he thinks physics is done. You know, there might be, there may be just like a, a few tiny details, but we basically know the story. We're done. And, and this is the sort of spirit I wanted to express here. But of course, I mean, again, so it's a simple message. If you want to really dive into the meaning of this word, it's just like, don't do it. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Do you want to take one more from Larissa? Sure. Yeah. Just have a table Absolutely. of coffee break. I'm yeah. curious to hear what Larissa wants to say. Larissa? Um, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, works well. Okay. Good, good. So I just I have a little bit of a comment in that I think that um, what this idea, as nice as it is, doesn't address is that there are still things that need an explanation and that uh, an explanation that a theory of consciousness could give that have nothing to do with dynamics, right? So um, we, for example, you know, um, the notion of, of individuation or exclusion that is pushed by IIT, right? So like, how do I find the borders of my consciousness and the borders of your consciousness? And how do I identify the entities that um, the conscious entities within a physical model. And um, that, for example, doesn't have to do with, with dynamics, but it's still something that requires an explanation. Right? And why would you think that in contrast, a conflict with the things I've presented? No, 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 not, not in conflict. I'm just saying or, or, that. Or anyway, like, how, why do you, because I, I would agree, obviously, you know, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I, I'm just I would bringing say... it up because I thought that it, it might uh, sound as if, you know, if a, a theory of consciousness is not um, against causal closure, right, that then it has no predictive values, yeah. right? Yeah. And that is, that is yeah. not true, I think. So this is, of course, yeah, this, I, I, I am claiming that. It's just in a different talk. <laughs> Um, so, um, but I do think that, yeah, so maybe we need to discuss it outside, but it's, this is this recent result by Stefan and I, yeah, um, happy to discuss this. Thanks for the yep. content.